Good morning, this is Mark DePue, Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. I'm here with Charlie Carey. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning. Um, it's uh, April 9th, 2010. We are here to talk about the opening bell uh, in the uh, options the pit in the grain markets. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, why don't you tell us what we're about ready to see? Well, at, uh, at 9.30, and probably since uh, the 1800s, they'd open this market at 9.30, we're going to open the grain markets. And uh, the grain markets are anticipated to open higher in response to the uh, uh, World uh, Grain Stock Report that came out at 7.30 this morning. So it'll be interesting to see the interaction. This, this here is the corn options pit, and uh, being from the Midwest, we grow a lot of corn here. The far side is soybean options. Uh, this is corn futures. In the center? In the center, and then on the far side of the room is soybeans, and we have uh, wheat trading over there. So you, you've got an idea, all, all the grains open at the same time, and they all trade on a relationship basis. People will trade one versus another. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, uh, what kind of a flurry of activity we have at these higher levels this morning. Can you tell us uh, what your, you've got a pretty tight schedule today. Uh, what happens right after we're done filming for you? Well, we do our other job, which is we're meeting with uh, uh, Senator Stabenow from Michigan uh, to talk about uh, regulation and uh, in light of the, uh, uh, the, the, the current proposals in Congress, we want to make sure that uh, uh, that the U.S. remains the benchmark pricing for these agricultural commodities. We want to make sure that that uh, the regulation provides for uh, good, efficient markets, but does not uh, disadvantage the U.S. Uh, compared to other uh, uh, places in the world where they can trade these commodities. Is this a routine occurrence that you have uh, visitors like this that you have to take care of? Uh, well, it, it's a yeah, it's a big part of the job. Uh, we we uh, were regulated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, prior to that, it was the Commodity Exchange Authority, and uh, we've always enjoyed a, a good working relationship with the regulator because the integrity in this marketplace is key to keeping the business here. There's been an awful lot of talk recently because of the recession, the severe recession we're in, to uh, kind of have more overwatch from the government, more regulations. Right. Is that part of the discussion today? Well, uh, today, uh, I'm sure it will be part of the discussion. You know, people want to know why did prices go up. I think we had a pretty good discussion yesterday about a lot of the reasons that contributed. Uh, some people want to blame speculators and participation in these markets. Uh, I would say that uh, there are far more global factors affecting the price of commodities now than, than ever in the past, and, and I think we highlighted some of them uh, yesterday. But, uh, but these markets are open, they're transparent. Anybody can trade here who has a trading account and a, and a firm to, to guarantee his trades. And really, this is where uh, farmers and, and, and commercials can offset their risk in these uh, trading pits here. Okay, we've got about 30 seconds before the market begins, so very quickly. Well, put your fingers in your yeah. ear and hopefully we get some noise out of this uh, uh, options pit here. What would be uh, your official position as far as regulation? Would you prefer to see less or uh, you're okay well, I, with a little I bit more? I just want it to be balanced and even-handed, that's all. Okay. I think you have to take a, a prudent approach, and I think what you have to guard against is uh, uh, regulation that's reactive to a, a certain narrow set of uh, circumstances versus looking at the big picture. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to you because we're seconds away from the bell. Okay. Uh, like I said, we should get a little excitement. I don't see. Okay. Uh, we're, we're seeing the uh, corn futures pit. Uh, they've opened the market uh, with the prices. It looks like it's about three and a half cents higher, not quite as high as they had anticipated. Wheat is eight cents higher, and soybeans are 10 cents higher in the old crop but they're only three cents higher in the new crop. And, and that's because the grain stocks were, were forecast to be 190 million bushels at the end of this year, which is a little bit tight. If there's any surprises, uh, that's not a lot of surplus to deal with coming into the end of the year. Why are we seeing so many more people in the options pit than in the futures pit? Well, the futures uh, pits today are uh, uh, not as populated because uh, about 90% of the futures transactions take place on the Globex platform, they take place electronically, where people anywhere in the world can access these markets within nanoseconds and have the same access that anybody else does. So there are still certain strategies uh, that are sent to the pit, there are still people that participate in the pit, but in options, 
it's it's the reverse. 80 percent, 80 to 90 percent of that business is done in the pit because uh, it's just the nature of, of the uh, instrument. People still like to use the open outcry markets uh, okay. for price discovery and options. I want you to take some time now to explain to us the geography of the pit, what it means to be on certain levels, what it means to be wearing certain le uh, colors of coats, things like that. Well, the, the geography is, is uh, basically so that there's an understanding of what uh, you're trading in, because as you can see, it gets loud down here, and sometimes you can't hear everything perfectly. So when, when it gets active and there's multiple voices hollering to compete for the same uh, order or the same price, okay, uh, the bottom line is, is if you're standing in this uh, part of the pit, you're trading the front months, possibly the May options you or the, the what? We're saying the camera's the, the right side? Uh, yes, uh, we're looking at the corn option pit, and those closest to us are probably trading the options on, on May corn, which will expire in about uh, two weeks. Uh, and in the back of the pit, they're trading things for, further out, like new crop corn, December corn is what they'd be doing. So anyway, uh, that geography helps the marketplace flow, tells people where to put their orders in, and tells the people participating, it, it helps them to make sure that there aren't any mistakes in the execution or disagreements in the execution. How about the different levels in the pit? What does that mean to us? Well, generally the order uh, uh, fillers are on the top step so that they can access uh, the computers on the outside and the clerks can access them to bring them orders. So when they're representing a customer there, they, there's easier access and better communication to those people that are on the phones or, or back in their offices anywhere in the Midwest okay. or around the world. Tell us a little bit about the different colors. I mean, it's obvious that these bright color coats mean things to people. Yeah, it's it's like the steps. They, they, it, it's, it, it communicates what firm you're with. So that's one other form of, of communication. Uh, if you're wearing a green jacket, you trade through Iowa Grain, perhaps. If you're wearing a blue jacket, you, or a uh, uh, you might be trading through uh, 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 ADM investors. Uh, you might uh, purple jacket Rosenthal. So that again, it's all forms of communication. The bright jackets. Now it might be somebody's just personal taste, but more more often than not, it indicates a company. So somebody can look at the color and 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 help them record their trades and know who their counterparty is when they're trading with each other. Did the colors change when there was the merger? No. No, we were allowed to keep our culture, and they were allowed to keep their. Okay. They had they had stricter rules on clerks' jackets than we did. We allowed the clerk to wear the same color jacket as the broker that he's working for, which is an easier identification. The Merck uh, had their clerks all wear mustard color jackets so that you could tell who the clerks were. But we thought it was more important to uh, structure it this way so that people could identify the teams of brokers that they're working with. How do you differentiate looking down there the actual traders versus uh, the runners that you've been talking about? And what well, are the positions? Well, well, generally, if you look at somebody, the runners don't have a badge. If you look at the members, uh, over in that uh, corn pit, you'll see a yellow badge with uh, some letters on it. They're called, that's called an acronym. And you might take your initials. My, my badge says CPC, Charles Peter Carey. Uh, it could be uh, the name of your son or daughter. It could be something, just something that, again, a form of communication. People can look at that badge, look at the color of the jacket, and they can record that transaction on a card or more than likely uh, uh, into a handheld, uh, which will put it into the current system. Okay. For a novice like myself looking out here, it looks like total chaos. I know from your perspective it's very controlled, orchestrated chaos. Mm -hmm. Explain to us things like what we're looking at with the hand gestures then, and, how, and actually what's transpiring down there. Communication, trade, principle to principle. Uh, the hands can be used to indicate a quantity. The hands can be used to indicate a price. The hands can be used to indicate a contract month so that all these things are agreed upon before the transaction is fully agreed upon. Because if there's an error uh, through communication, you'll, you'll have what you call an outtrade. I thought I bought December corn from you at a price. You thought you sold me May corn at a different price. That has to be resolved. We have rules and regulations for resolving those things. And that was the original intention of the Chicago Board of Trade in 1848 was allowing for disputes to be resolved without going to a court of law. 
you went to a group of your peers, they were resolved and allowed you to, to speed up your commercial transactions and have certainty in the transactions that you made. So basically, the market existed to improve the efficiency of these exchanges? The market? No, the exchanges improve the efficiency of the markets because okay. Uh, okay. I would say the reverse because the exchanges uh, uh, originally were chambers of commerce or boards of trade and that's how we got the name Chicago Board of Trade and then they evolved into these futures uh, trading pits uh, that came around sometime in the 1870s. So this, this has just been a constant evolution of, uh, of the exchanges to meet the needs of the marketplace. Was the open outcry pit a innovation that's that's unique to the Chicago Board of Trade. Were you guys the first to be doing that? I think we have a patent on the, the design for the pit, you know, uh, uh, that goes back to the 1870s. And I think if you look around at, at the archives, they have pictures of them building the first pit and the, and the uh, architect's renderings of the first pit, so that people could stand in a structured place and know if they were trading corn or wheat or rye or oats. How do we know when a transaction has been completed? Just by watching the action here. Well, only the principals know for certain. You know, the two people, the most important thing is that the, the, that is just, uh, that gentleman with his hands exposed outward is offering uh, a, a, an option uh, on corn at a price, probably multiple contracts, and people are bidding lower and they're trying to haggle over that half cent differential. Okay. Once the transaction is done, are they writing it down on a piece of paper or handing it to the runners? Uh, what's well, the gen next step? Gen generally, when it's done in these pits, it, it's it's uh, it's put on a piece of paper. It's handed to a clerk, and the clerk's responsibility is to input it into the computer, like that gentleman is doing right before your eyes. You see him type; he's typing trades in into the system, and they're being cleared uh, online instantaneously. Okay. Then we've got over on the right-hand side here all of the computer terminals and and. Uh, and, when, and cubicles, what's going on there? What's, what's going on here is these people are, are uh, running desks for firms or for customers, and what they do is they generally service the customers from these positions. So prior to computers and electronic trading, the only way to get a, a, an order in if you weren't here yourself on the floor was to phone it in. And they'd phone it to these people, these people would record it, time stamp it, then deliver it uh, to the uh, appropriate pit for execution. Okay. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about the boards, because that's also, uh, that's an awful lot of information for the novice to try to comprehend. Oh yeah, it's, it's uh, those, uh, those wall boards are expensive items too, I can tell you that. But when you look up there, what you see on the wall board is, uh, uh, you see in this quadrant, you're seeing wheat prices, and you're seeing May wheat, which will go off the board in about six weeks. You see the July wheat, which is your first new crop wheat. And then next to that, uh, you'll see various spreads communicated where they're trading May, July, or, or May, Sep. These Some people just trade the differentials between the different months. And then, then following that is the corn prices, and then you get into uh, soybean meal prices, oil price, soybean oil prices, and then soybean prices. Those are the big boards up top. Below that, you see smaller uh, 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 displays, and that's for all the other markets that could have an effect here. You see stock, uh, you see an S&P quote, you see uh, the price of metals, uh, uh, they're on this board. You see uh, the price of cotton, you see the price of lumber, you see all the things that affect the economy are displayed because traders may be standing here, but they may have a position in a different marketplace uh, by virtue of putting an order in and, uh, 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 and, and trading that market. So you got crude oil prices up there. Everything's somewhat interrelated. Yeah, maybe that's display. something that I wasn't prepared to, to understand. It makes perfect sense as you describe it here, how all of these markets are interrelated. When one market moves, it impacts another as well. Yeah, they're, 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 they're interrelated by virtue of money flows and, and sometimes by virtue of substitutability. I mean, there's an energy component to the price of corn now. It's called ethanol. So if somebody's trading corn because of ethanol, they want to look at the uh, crude oil prices and see if our prices up or down and how will that affect the margins in the ethanol business. 
this has been a wonderful experience to spend the last couple of days with you. Uh, you got a couple more minutes, Charlie, before you got to run and see the senator. Uh, yes. Any final words that you want to give us, Ed? Well, I, I hope that uh, the, the people that uh, are able to view this uh, learn a little bit about this, and, and I'm very pleased that we're uh, we're putting this into uh, archives and historical. Uh, vault so that people uh, can know what we've done for a living for a long, long time around here. Uh, these markets grew up with the Midwest, grew up with the city of Chicago, and they've been an integral part. And the form of the centralized marketplace uh, is evolving to the electronic marketplace, which does not have the personality, does not have the faces. It's merely a price on a screen. So uh, I hope this is around for a long, long time, but you, right now you can tell that the electronic trading has taken over in the futures because the noise would have been deafening on a day like today. You couldn't hear yourself think if they were trading here, but they're all looking at these electronic screens. And that's something that the marketplace demanded. And so we met the needs of the marketplace. Unfortunately, it has an impact on the culture that we all grew up with. Yeah. Well, uh, I can tell why uh, it gets in the blood after you do this for a little while. Uh, and uh, it's exciting to be down here in the pit. And again, it's just been a wonderful experience. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you. Thanks for uh, coming in and doing these interviews. Okay. Thank you. That's it.